Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's program. We're going to be in here in just a few minutes. Once again, welcome to today's program. We will begin our program in one minute. Hello and welcome to today's AWCI Media Online Learning Series program, Friend or Foe, The Architect and Subcontractor Relationship Explained, sponsored by Pabco Gypsum. I am Anne-Marie Salvatelli, AWCI's Director of Education and Foundation Programs. I will be your host for today's presentation. I am joined today by Chris Williams, AWCI's Director of Membership and Development and Engagement, who will moderate today's program. Good day to everyone, and thank you for joining us. On your screen, you'll see our first poll question of the day to help us determine how many are in our audience. We'd like to know how many people are viewing today's webinar with you today. Please click, click on your selection on your screen to submit. We'll have more questions throughout today's broadcast, so be on the lookout. Before we start today, we have a few housekeeping items that all attendees um, should be on mute during today's presentation. However, we ask that you please mute your phones or computer microphones as well to ensure that we keep the line clear for our presenters. Should you have a question at any time during today's broadcast, please submit it um, by using the question box in your GoToMeeting dashboard. We'll have a brief Q&A at the end of our presentation as well, and we will make every attempt to get all of your questions answered. If you have any audio and visual issues during today's presentation, do not hesitate to let us know and use the chat function in your dashboard, or you can email me directly at selvatelli at awci.org. We will attempt to resolve any issues um, that may arise as quickly as possible. Today's program will be recorded and uploaded to AWCI Media YouTube channel. 
And all attendees will receive a link to access this as well as other recordings from AWCI. And this will hit your inboxes about an hour after the program, and it will include a link to our brief follow-up survey. Today's PowerPoint slides may be downloaded by clicking the handouts link in your dashboard. Thank you to today's sponsor, Pamco Gypsum. I'd like to introduce Mike Amaral, Director of Sales and Marketing at Pamco Gypsum. Mike, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mike Amaral, Director of Sales and Marketing for Pabco Gypsum and QuietRock. Pabco Gypsum is a leading gypsum wallboard manufacturer in the Western United States, and QuietRock is the company's sound-reducing drywall. QuietRock is the first and most advanced family of sound-reducing drywall products and accessories available throughout all of North America. I'm excited to introduce this webinar, Friend or Foe, the Architect, General Contractor, and Subcontractor Relationship Explained. Of course, we want them to be friends. Managing the complexity of this interrelationship between contractor, GC, and sub is crucial. The success of your project depends on a healthy relationship between them, and that relationship starts by giving them all a seat at the planning table. Each has their role to play, and each has a unique perspective and insight that should be heard at the onset to help planning and execute the project successfully. This gives each the opportunity to enlighten others as to the anticipated challenges, find solutions, and create an environment of cohesive success before the construction event even starts. Equally important is the inclusion of the product manufacturers. The manufacturers can provide crucial physical, engineering and installation insights as to their products, ensuring that their product attributes are well understood by all members of the team, where the product goes, why it was selected, and what are the unique characteristics that make that product choice acceptable to the project. Understanding these details by all around the planning table will lead to less confusion, less disruption on the job site, and ultimately success. One of PAPCO's key values as an organization is developing meaningful relationships with our customers and employees. We take this very seriously and have developed many strong relationships with our dealers, contractors, and architects. Those relationships have greatly contributed to our success and the success of many projects over the years. And with that, I'd like to hand it back over to Chris. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mike, and we appreciate PAPCO's support of today's program. Before we get started today, I wanted to talk a little bit about format for this program. Today's webinar will be conversational in nature. Instead of focusing on PowerPoint slides and notes, like a traditional webinar, our speakers will answer questions from both Anne-Marie and I, as well as those submitted by you, our audience. As we go along, we encourage you to participate in today's discussion and submit your questions using your webinar dashboard. It's your chance to get frank and honest insights from two speakers who, quite frankly, have been part of the successful design and construction relationships. Also, you'll see poll questions pop up on your screen periodically throughout today's conversation. Your responses will help guide the direction of our discussion. So I'd like to welcome today's presenters, Gabriel Castillo and Eli Hinojos. Gabriel is a Colombian architect and a civil engineer with over two decades of experience with rain screen facades. He's collaborated with construction material manufacturers to introduce rain screen lines to the US market. His global construction experience includes working with and for real estate developers, general contractors, and financing institutions. Gabriel's approach to work includes the creative inspiration of architecture, detail, precision of engineering, and a keen sense of market trends. Eli Hinojos, project executive at California Drywall. He's worked in our industry for the last 22 years in various roles, including field estimating and project management. He recently participated in the collaboration and delivery of one of the largest and very successful IPD projects in Northern California, the CPC Van Ness Hospital. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Gabriel, I'll start off with you. First question here, uh, can you explain for our audience your background in construction and how it shaped your viewpoint, not only in the architect general contractor, construction manager relationship and subcontractor relationship, but also the inclusion of the manufacturers at the table? Oh, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, um, as you mentioned before, um, I've been in uh, different sides of the table. I've been in the manufacturer's side, I've been in the contractor's side, and I've been dealing with, uh, um, as a general contractor, um, dealing with uh, subcontractors in trying to make the building work and the details work. Um, being in different uh, sides of the table has shown me the uh, 
frustrations in uh, the um, good things that you can have in each one of the angles. Uh, to me, is a collaboration. Um, everybody has to be a part of the decision making. Everybody has uh, good input, uh, and everybody has a different uh, viewpoint that is, is going to be uh, perfect uh, for a successful project. At the end, we want to do a project. We're going to build a project that is is well designed and performs. Okay, thank you. Eli, uh, this question is for you. As a project executive for one of the biggest subcontractors on the West Coast, tell us a bit about how California Drywall has been able to help build a collaborative atmosphere among a project's key players. Well, in, in part, it has been the focus and quality that um, as a company we've strived to give every project that we're um, awarded. Uh, regardless of the size and the, or the duration of our project, it's always our goal for uh, us to provide a successful project based on our standards, but even more um, based on the client's conditions of satisfactions. Um, our past successes on, on projects usually have a common theme, which I think goes well with your question, that uh, the, the projects that are most successful for us is when most of the stakeholders are all working very well together. So in order to achieve this outcome, uh, we've decided to take a proactive approach on developing relationships with all the key players on the, the various projects that we have. Uh, one way we've been able to do this is by um, actually um, bringing our project management team when possible uh, to the site. You know, when we do this, this enables us to have face-to-face -face relationships and develop um, you know, a good um, a relationship with our clients. And not only that, then be able to share and pass on our past experiences and lessons learned. Uh, but not every project permits us to do so, but we still uh, go ahead and make it our point, our goal to nourish that relationship whichever way we can, either offsite meetings, uh, going out there as much as we can, and just try and be as collaborative as possible with, uh, with everyone that's on that team. Neil, you mentioned a little bit about the uh, the hierarchy, the collaborative hierarchy you guys on the website. So the next question is for both of you. you know, we've all been in the industry long enough, I'm not calling us old, but we remember the old days uh, way back when the chain of command it was pretty rigid between the owner down to the architect, and the architect begat the general contractor to the CM, and then the subcontractors at the very bottom. And then we look at how has that evolved over the past 10 years? Are we still have the same structure in place. Are we, are we more collaborative? on the job site like we see on the screen, or do we still maintain that old rigid structure? And Eli, I'll start with you on that. Sure, um, well, in the last 10 years, I'm starting to notice a growing change in our behavior. Uh, there are enough success stories to prove the value of opening the chain, chain of command uh, to others in lieu of just one or two entities. Uh, when an owner, an architect, or the GCCM and the specialists allow everyone to come to the table with their own lessons learned and experiences, you now have the buy-in and success of a team in comparison to only one. Gabriel, your thoughts on that? Um, definitely, I've seen more of a collaboration. Uh, what I see is that uh, the message or the uh, information that the manufacturer gives to the architect or the attention that the architect has on uh, different aspects. Uh, it's different from uh, the conversation that the manufacturer is having with the installer. Uh, more technical, more of uh, how we're going to work on the logistics or how we can make it easier for you. Um, uh, the owner is, is concerned with aesthetics and, of course, uh, uh, price. Uh, so what I've seen is that the collaboration is, is getting more and more, but then the, uh, the message is different. The architect is interested or focused on on certain aspects of the product system or the uh, material that, are, that we're talking about. Uh, the subcontractor is uh, more concerned with the uh, uh, installation, uh, procurement, and um, how you can make it, make it work. Definitely, um, I see the manufacturer more into the middle of this uh, uh, presentation, this, this slide, where it's collaborating with everybody. And I'll ask a quick follow-up question for both of you, and simple yes or no, if you like. You can expand on it if you'd like, too. Has, you know, and this is pure curiosity, from the thawing of relations, that new, you saw our poll results, uh, the old rigid structure seems to be definitely outdated. 
is that new collaborative style, especially from the architect and the owner standpoint, is it a result of just changing times, or do you think there's something to do with the generational changes that we're underseeing in our industry as a whole, moving from uh, baby boomers and uh, early Gen Xers to now more late Gen X, Gen Z, and millennials and positions of power? Um, this is Eli. I would say probably both. I think we have a nice combination of, of the two working well together to try to push for that collaborative environment. Excellent. So next question uh, for both of you guys. What role has technology? So we've got BIM, augmented reality, uh, jo integrated job site apps, uh, and even now blockchain is starting to move into construction. What role has technology played in the evolution of the architect, GC, and sub relationship? Has it helped kind of give subcontractors a seat at the table earlier in the design process? And Gabriel, I'll start with you. Oh, definitely um, technology is, is playing a big role. Uh, visualization. Uh, now the uh, owner um, has the uh, the ability to see in augmented reality uh, the building and then kind of navigate through uh, the different components. Uh, the architect can see a 3D and rotate and and actually visualize the uh, the uh, clashes and the um, uh, issues that would have the different components will have. Um, and also, I see that uh, the fact that we have uh, uh, the technology to be able to communicate or meet uh, or collaborate online uh, easily, that is um, speed up the uh, the process and has made this collaboration easier and is not as apprehensive as it was 10, 15 years ago when the meeting was complex. Eli? Thoughts? Yeah, no, uh, great question. And actually, um, you know, as as we talk about the old days, um, it seemed like things were just a lot slower. Everything was hindered by a one person at a time handoff, um, and you waited days or weeks to get a response, <clears throat> or you even to be able to coordinate with something. But in reality, technology has become like the the sandbox for which um, all three you know entities uh, can play in. Uh, for for us, the BIM and the integrated job site apps have opened up the flow of information and design change to real time with multi users. Um, uh, as a drywall subcontractor, we were typically the, the last uh, trade partner to be brought into a project. However, um, the use of BIM, uh, architects and general contractors are now seeing the value of having us, uh, you know, populate a model, uh, be part of the coronation early on with the, the larger other systems. And that has now helped the delivery as well as avoiding unnecessary constraints during construction. And I'll ask this question of both of you, a follow-up question. Uh, mentioned blockchain. Have you, either of you had experience with blockchain on projects uh, implemented by the owner, the architect, or the GC? It's fairly new in the process, fairly new in our industry. So it's just a pure curiosity question here, guys. Uh, for Eli, no, I I have not had the experience yet. No, Bob, not in my my experience. Well, we'll circle back to that question about five years from now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, and moving on, um, another question for both of you. It's a little bit of a loaded question, but what should the GCCM's role be in facilitating the relationship between subcontractors and architects? What what does it currently look like? And Eli, we'll start with you. Well, um, we, we are moving away from the old school mentality of uh, being the sole mediator between um, uh, the, the general contractor and the architect. Um, and we only, we want to see an open forum to be able to have a direct relationship with the architect. Uh, when we do that, and when we actually have that access, it permits, uh, let's just say, for example, us as a soft contractor, uh, the ability to understand the vision and the intent of the designer and for the architect, um, the understanding of the constraints one has as a builder, but as well as most um, the productive and cost-effective way of achieving the design that the architect is trying to accomplish. Um, Thank you. Uh, and Gabriel? Yeah, uh, as I see that most of the general contractors are moving more into the construction management, 
um, the subcontractor's role has has uh, become more important uh, to the fact that uh, the technical conversation between the um, architect and the subcontractor has become a, a key role on the relationship. is is no longer the, the the case where you have to go through your general contractor to ask for a question and and wait for the reply back via the general contractor. Um, I've seen more and more of that collaboration, and the, of course the general contractor and the construction manager is involved in the conversation, but uh, primarily is being uh, lead by the architect and the uh, subcontractor. Thank you. All right, next question. In case um, in cases where there's a communication breakdown in the relationship, or a complete lack of communications between stakeholders on the project team, how is that resolved? Is there a mechanism to engage key players that can help resolve issues and prevent them from becoming bigger issues on the job site? Uh, Gabriel, we'll start with you on your response, please. Uh, now that uh, construction has become more and more technically advanced, uh, job drawings, uh, the details, um, are are typically uh, a way of communicating. So um, having RFIs in the job drawings is is I think is a very important uh, tool uh, to resolve those uh, those uh, blocks. Um, we try to always be uh, open open minded or open book. Um, be proactive on detecting um, uh, issues or um, Situations where uh, the layout is not uh, is not according to what the uh, building uh, site is, and uh, just be very proactive, um, and, and that is um, is being a um, very good solution to minimize uh, these conflicts. Thank you, and Eli, your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, the best jobs are going to have um, breakdowns in communication. There, there's going to be uh, at times challenges and issues. So uh, it, it goes right back to the key of having communication and being able to bring those hard conversations up to uh, the forefront. Uh, but typically what happens in, in some cases is that uh, you don't start talking about the issues or the concerns uh, or the breakdowns till you know, weeks or months later or even at the end of the project and then you realize that uh, you don't have really anything you can do to to resolve it um, but if you would have had those conversations earlier you would have been able to have a, a positive effect um, I do believe that there's a mechanism out there to be able to resolve you know issues um, that deal with uh, relationships and communications within a project team and I, I feel that it starts at the very beginning um, from the very top down creating a, um, uh, a behavior or an environment where everybody that is at that uh, stakeholder level um, can come to the table and say, hey, I got a problem, I need to resolve it. Uh, so when that happens, then the behavior of the team, uh, you know, acknowledges uh, that that person or that uh, company has a struggle and collaboratively everybody comes together, listens to it, and then, um, you know, makes a, an agreed um, decision that uh, supports the team's uh, position moving forward and then as individual um, trade partners or companies uh, we help not only our office management but also the, the field uh, side of it uh, support whatever that decision was. And a quick follow-up on that question uh, in terms of as subcontractors I'm trying I'm thinking of a way to word this the best in finding our voice, is it, is it important that as subcontractors we find our voice early on in the process, even before the project begins, in order to kind of establish ourselves as key players in the design and construction process? Um, going back to that, that lack of communications, that resolving issues in the job site. Um, I'll take this one first, if it's okay with Gabriel. Um, as a subcontractor, um, it has to start at the beginning. If, if not, then um, when do you get the uh, the courage <laughs> to be able to speak up uh, when schedule gets uh, very busy or there's uh, a lot of uh, constraints or, or challenges for the team? But if you have that from the very beginning started and 
once again, if, if it's a culture that the team is trying to uh, have everyone be a part of um, at, at that early stage of pre-con or just engaging um, uh, the trade partners to start with, um, with construction, it makes things a lot easier. It's a lot easier to work with ones that you feel that you have a, a trust um, and a friendship with and someone that uh, you're not sure what side you're on with. Um, uh, we have uh, we have uh, tried to go to the pre-construction meeting and bring the manufacturer, and sometimes we bring the um, the engineer that produced the chop drawings for a rain screen for that to the pre-construction meeting. So everybody knows uh, and everybody has the faces of the different components of the different uh, companies that work uh, to make this uh, the project uh, available. And uh, that also gives you a one-to-one -one relationship. It's no longer an email or a, or a chain of emails where you hear people chiming in or discussing. Uh, a, you know, uh, but it's actually uh, somebody that I met um, at the beginning of the project and, as a lot say, uh, build up a trust and confidence that I can come up to or any one of them and say, you know what, um, we have a problem. I, I oversaw this or this came up. How do we solve this? as a group. Thanks, guys. And a follow-up to the follow-up. I promise the last follow-up on this question. Has the advent of electronic communication in the last 20 years, using email to communicate more frequently than, I guess, phone calls, has that played a role in giving subs more of a, a voice or at least an amplified voice early on in the process, making it easier to facilitate communications? I've seen the volume of emails uh, exponentially grow and uh, the quality of the information that moves around is, is diminishing. Uh, you get 100 emails and, and uh, that could have been resolved in two or three or basically in one conversation face to face. Uh, it's good, it's bad. Um, I think the volume of, uh, of, of emails is increased and the expectation of a response has been reduced to uh, seconds. Uh, somebody's expecting uh, a reply to an email on an RFI or a very detailed uh, situation within hours. Yeah, I agree with Gabriel. It's it's uh, kind of a double-edged sword. It, it's a great way to um, communicate information to one or, or many people at you know at just at the click of uh, of uh, your mouse. However, it, it does take you away from uh, the conversations that can be had one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Um, and, and be able to address matters a little quicker or, or avoid sometimes the loss of translation between uh, words that are found on, on your screen than actually um, uh, expressions that you have, you know, using your voice or your facial gestures, um, things of that matter. Yeah, I have a rule of the third text or a third email, pick up the phone or meet. Uh, that, that, is gonna, that seems to be a longer conversation than just a back and forth or a yes and no. All right, thanks guys on that one. Eli, this uh, next question is for you and it's project specific. Uh, California Drywall's AWCI Excellence in Construction Quality Award application for the CPMC Van Ness Hospital project. You mentioned that Lean Integrated Project Delivery, IPD, was used and that the design and construction partners all co-located at the job site to create what I term a leadership roundtable. Can you expand a bit and talk a little bit about how that setup helped with communications and the decision-making coordination while on site? Um, yes, uh, yeah, thanks for giving us an opportunity to share a little bit about that uh, great success story for us. Um, the mechanism I suggested above was exactly what was practiced um, at the uh, CPMC Van Ness Hospital uh, project, uh, where we were able to collaborate and, and address, uh, you know, challenges uh, rather quickly. And the reason for that was because the, the project permitted all the, uh, the major stakeholders to be co-located under one roof. Um, we were just kitty corners to the actual projects out there in San Francisco. Um, everyone from the owner, the general contractor, the architect, and every major discipline or system was on site. So this enabled us to have face-to-face uh, -face communication and coordination um, every day that we were there on, on site. Um, in regards to where we sat, um, with all the different team players as Cal Dry California Drywall, uh, we had the, the opportunity, I, I would say also privilege of sitting right by the architect. 
uh, three of the lead architects were just um, you know a few spaces away from us so that permitted us to just go around and uh, have that one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation understand what they were trying to um, accomplish and and many of the times it was also the architect that came over to us and said hey how can how can we uh, resolve this uh, design uh, question or or just better ways of, of building something um, that collaboration didn't just happen with us and the architect, it, it happened with the mechanical sub, um, subcontractor, the electrical um, the structure at times, and just everyone in general. And even to be able to go to the owner and have a, a sit down conversation and discuss what the owner's you know, view overall was, uh, was very helpful. Um, and, uh, I think that co-location environment then provided to the whole team a, a unified team spirit so when we did have to have discussions that were hard, uh, there was a level of respect, a little a level of trust because we're all on one um, mission to have one great uh, project. And uh, that really helped out a lot. Um, one of the things that I thought was very uh, unique to the project was um, in the office as well as in the field, there was daily check-ins that we called it the daily huddle. At that uh, location or that time, we were able to discuss uh, what our schedule was showing us had to be done that week or you know that day um, and and if in case something had kind of slipped which we know always does um, how would we um, you know mediate it how would we take care of it so having once again the co-location having everybody involved there you didn't feel like you were all by yourself in your own silo or having to deal with a, a problem of a very large project all on your own so we did that at an office level as well as a field level, and really, it's uh, you know the uh, we had great success from it. Excellent. So I'll move on to our next question, and Gabriel, this one's specifically for you. Uh, you mentioned that the relationship needs to be expanded to include product manufacturers, especially in the design stage, as it helps mitigate some of the make it work issues that the owner and architect might pass down to the contractor team. What does the involvement look like, and have you started to see this more and more in your jobs? Um, uh, the um, manufacturer's role is very important. As I see the architect gets the uh, lunch and learn, uh, learn about the product, uh, learn about the, uh, the system, how how you put it together. But then all of so all of a sudden, the architect um, goes away and start building or designing the the, the building and comes across with detail, specific details and uh, I've seen as a contractor a 50%, 80% DD uh, sets where there's still some conflict, there's still some details that are not resolved. I call the manufacturer and say, well, why did you get this uh, project go that far? Well, they say, well, I, I never, I never got, got back uh, to that uh, design firm, I, I never talked to the architect. I think the architect has to use uh, the manufacturers as a good resource. Uh, meet, get to know the product, understand what the product can do and cannot do. Uh, but also, once you get um, to a situation where you have a detail, uh, use the manufacturer as, as a reference. The manufacturer may uh, give you the, uh, the limitations of the product, but also can point a uh, point uh, direction of the architect to an installer or local installer in that market that can give you feedback on uh, installation uh, numbers. So you can, as an architect, you can come back to your owner and say, hey, this is pretty much what you can afford, or this is pretty much what you can do. Um, I see the design assist um, situations where the architects, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the contractors have been offering uh, design assist um, services where we'll actually be in, uh, involved early in the design process to clean up all those details. Those details will be um, uh, hopefully uh, by the 100% construction or the issue for construction set will be um, uh, minimized and, um, and that will also result on a smoother construction process. And I'll follow up with a question uh, for both of you and Gabriel, you touched on it there a little bit. Uh, can you cite specific examples and projects where you guys as contractors have had to go to the GC or the CM or the architect and explain that elements of the project as they were designed just aren't feasible because of product limitations 
and, and if so, since those are during the project, could those conversations have been better handled during the design phase when manufacturer input could have potentially helped? Uh, saw the poll results here from in terms of how much influence do our subs have on the architect and GC's decision making on products, and 75% said some influence, 25% said the architect and the general contractor are dictating what we can use. Does that kind of play into some of those, what you mentioned, Gabriel, in terms of some of those potential issues that could have been headed off? Um, I have a couple of samples where we, um, we were doing some um, uh, rent screen facades with cement panels. And uh, the layout that the architect had uh, shown on the drawings um, exceeds the maximum dimensions uh, on the panels or the minimum dimension on the panels. Uh, this is something that could have been easily addressed uh, on a, a conference call or in a scope review or a shop drawing review. Um, on a terracotta project, uh, the architect wanted a 92-inch terracotta tile, uh, and uh, nobody, no manufacturer can produce a straight tile that long. And uh, we had to go back to the architect and show him that by using three tiles the same and, and achieve the same length, uh, you can visually uh, see the same uh, solution as opposed to uh, having a custom-made piece that is very expensive. So I, I definitely see that um, early involvement uh, it's, is, is very important, and I can see uh, that uh, that um, on a project that we just priced, uh, the value engineering or the uh, pricing um, came out like. 30% cheaper to uh, the, the, what the architect had shown on the layout. And it just by using uh, the experience that we have a, as a applicator, also the collaboration with the manufacturer to optimize the, the or minimize the waste, uh, production waste. And so those are all early conversations that are not affecting the, um, the design intent and they're not affecting the selection of the product, but is, is basically putting all the experience of the manufacturer and the installer into the design. Eli? Yeah, I, I agree with Gabriel. A, a lot of the impacts that we've had uh, have, also, have also been aligned with the exterior systems. Um, but I'd like to add, you know, one other area that uh, we've we've come to experience uh, some challenges has been with sound testing, um, and uh, we've found ourselves sometimes caught in the middle of design and the limitations of performance <clears throat> of a single or multi-manufacturer assembly. And unfortunately, when this occurs, it, you know, it, it costs money, it uh, costs time on the schedule, and, and you're trying to, you know, get uh, um, the system to be approved by a third party agency that's making sure that the sound testing requirement that was uh, brought up early on in design is met. Um, so kind of a lesson learned for us has been to bring in our proposed manufacturers um, during the pre-construction phase and meet with the, the architect and also whatever agency, third party agency is gonna be um, on site uh, once everything needs to be tested to make sure that uh, you know we have the right uh, assembly or system early on and, and if, if there is a concern if something can be met uh, or you know different manufacturer products don't play well together that we bring them up uh, to the very forefront and then uh, you know get that on the drawings get that approved and, and now we, we you know we just removed a, a constraint that we could have had at, at the you know at the end of the project so I'm going to ask a follow-up here and put you both on the spot uh, in terms of what we've just talked about do architects need to be out? Should there be a way for architects to work on a job site and, and co-locate with contractors for a period before they go into and set up their own, hang out their own shingle and start their own process? What I mean by that is, do you think that some of these issues that arise from an actual construction standpoint arise because architects don't necessarily understand the real world of construction? I have um, I have experience on on projects overseas. We worked on a project for almost three and a half years. Uh, the architect set up on um, office on site. Uh, the amount of clarifications, details, changes uh, got to a point that was uh, almost impossible to wait uh, for actually for weeks. 
to get a design uh, change or a clarification. Uh, the concrete was being poor as, as we were solving the problems. And, um, and it, it was a great experience. The architect uh, understood by uh, the end of the project, they, they got uh, very well versed on the complexity of the, uh, the ring stream facade that they had designed. Um, and and it was it was great for us because we were not just waiting and waiting uh, to hear back from two or three different architects or different uh, components. It was interesting uh, experience, um, and I've seen that in larger projects where the architect actually um, mobilized to site. Um, in the um, as a builder. Uh, you, you come across a lot of uh, comments that you hear, you, you know, you wish that the architect was out there in the field building what they designed. Um, but I, I do see a, a change where uh, many architectural firms are starting to get more involved, uh, working with uh, those, the specialty um, trade partners to be able to see, you know, does it make sense the way they've drawn it? Uh, how can you draw it in a way that is most effective, um, you know, for time, for costs? and actually feasible. So uh, even though uh, in the past we saw very little bit of that, uh, I do believe that we're seeing more and more. And, and the more that we can be in contact with the architect, the better off uh, we are as a subcontractor, but also for the designer. Yeah, this is where I'll step in and, and tell our architect friends that might be on the line with us. We appreciate the work that you do and thank you for being on job sites when you can. That, that, that will be my mea culpa to them. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, so next question for both of you. Change orders, um, part of the reality of our business incorporates them. How does having a pre-established relationship with your architect impact both the anticipation of potential changes and how you work through with an owner's new requirements? And Eli, if you can go first, please. Sure. Um, when there isn't a pre-established relationship with the architect, uh, we just don't know what to expect <laughs> as a subcontractor. Uh, however, if you're working closely with them, uh, you may have already had a light conversation about the potential change, um, how to achieve the desired outcome, and provide input on some of the fussy details that, as architects, they're trying to figure out. In most cases, there are always multiple ways to achieve the owner's re uh, new requirements, uh, some more expensive than others, but when you have a close relationship with the designer and the specialist, you can lean the design in the most cost-effective method. We've kind of seen that to be true. Going back Thank to you. the uh, collaboration, um, most likely, uh, um, some of the, most of the time we get involved in the design process or early on, so there is an initial relationship with the architect. Uh, so. That, help, that has helped us to come up with a, um, solutions early on or if we have a change order along the way, um, this is something that we may have already discussed or um, um, at that point the, um, the architect is relying on the uh, experience of the installer uh, to come up with a, a better solution or a cheaper solution. Great, thank you. And uh, another question for both of you, this um, would be a final question for both. What would your perfect architect look like and what role uh, would they ideally play in the entire owner-architect GC subcontractor relationship? And Gabriel, we'll start with you. Well, my ideal architect is, uh, I, I want him to create. I wanted to push uh, the uh, manufacturers to create products uh, that uh, that can um, uh, materialize their ideas, um, but uh, that requires a very close uh, relationship with them. Not only just to go and a, to a launch and learn and uh, just know about the product, but just really getting involved on, on how the uh, the manufacturing process is and. Uh, in understanding uh, the potential of the different products or systems. Um, the architects that, uh, that I see more and more, and frequently I see more and more, they're always thinking of showing me um, uh, renderings. What can we do this? Is there any product that, can, that I can curve and I can hang 
and then do this these shapes. Um, so those are the architects that are not only pushing the envelope uh, on the design side, but also very concerned of uh, this has to be built, and it has to be built um, efficiently in in uh, in an economical way. Thank you, and Eli, your thoughts on that, please. Yeah, um, I mean, really simple for me, um, a fellow peer in the, on the project, um, it's always great to work with people that you respect, you trust, um, that you have a friendship. So, um, you know, having the architect, which is leading the design, um, to be at that uh, same level uh, is my ideal goal. Um, when you do that, then you're able to engage on, you know, two-way two, two -way communication and take into, consider, into consideration uh, their expertise as well as the expertise that we have as uh, subcontractors. And so I'll, I'll ask this question too. You both just described what the perfect architect looks like. Are we closer today than we were 10 years ago to where that's the prevalent architect in the industry that you're working with? Um, I think technology is uh, on the communication is providing us the, um, the right tools to really interact and collaborate. Um, and the more you collaborate, the more you see the benefit of, of having uh, the manufacturer involved, having the installer or the contractor uh, involved. Um, so the architect will, will get better understanding on, on the um, limitations of the different product systems or materials. I see uh, the collaboration happening, uh, the level of uh, sophistication of the new systems, and in my case for the rain screen facades, the building envelope, it's been very sophisticated, so you need to keep up with uh, the new products, the, uh, the testing, the um, different ways to achieve that uh, great idea, and the architects are great, uh, coming up with uh, new uh, ideas in new ways of doing things. So we need to be able to realize that, those ideas. And I agree with Gabriel. Um, we're starting to see more and more of it. Uh, there's, uh, in the last few years, I've probably sat in more uh, meetings with uh, the designer um, and being able to talk uh, and figure out details together uh, for interior, for exterior applications than ever before. So I think we're heading the right direction. And when we do that, once again, uh, now you've you've really kind of brought in um, the design and the builder side together to be able to build a great project. Gabriel, Eli, any final thoughts before we wrap up today's presentation? Perfect then, gentlemen. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules uh, to sit down with us today and explore how the architect, an owner, uh, general contractor, construction manager, subcontractor relationship, and manufacturer relationships starting to evolve and become more collaborative and inclusive, uh, and how we can help as subcontractors can help facilitate a more productive and inclusive, inclusive relationship on the projects that we work on. And on behalf of AWCI, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us for today's AWCI Media Online Learning Series program. We would also like to thank Pabco Gypsum for their generous support of our webinar today. As a reminder, this program was recorded and you'll receive a link to AWCI's online program library, as well as a link to a brief post-event survey following the conclusion of today's broadcast. In addition, we also have some great resources available through the foundation of the wall and ceiling industry, which you may access by visiting our website. And um, our next AWCI Media Online Learning Series program, Competing and Winning, How to Set Your Company Apart. This will take place on Thursday, September 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Be on the lookout for an email with details on how to register next week. Thanks again and have a productive day.